Hey everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. In today's podcast, we're going to talk with a astute young man who is, he has actually lots of talents. We'll, we'll talk about those as well. But we have with us here, Mr. Daryl Scipio. How are you doing, sir? I'm well. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. No, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Right? We, isn't that right, Hank? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, 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 uh, I'm, 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 I'm somewhat intimidated by your track record, but I can, you know, just sitting here chatting with you, I just feel a great humility in, in, in you and that, um, and sometimes I think you will agree that it's difficult for people to separate um, what they do. No, the what, separate the what they are from who they are. So and I are, like yeah. how you're able to just be who you are and that is, just absolutely ama amazing and fascinating to me. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Daryl, earlier we talked about a lot of great things, right? And mm -hmm. one of the things that we talked about, where I believe we're, believe we're go going towards, was the the importance of ownership. Can you touch on that for us? Sure. Um, I'm going to try not to say um again. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you're fine you're fine it's it's yeah no, nothing to worry about it's okay it's fun ownership is freedom mm. particularly land ownership anywhere in the world where you can own some land would mean that you have a, you get to have a say in what goes on there you're not you're not on the table you're at the, you're you're sitting at the table when you can own land but when you're not when you're not owning land then you are you know things happen to you um, and so wow. land ownership is probably the most important thing that people from the from the african diaspora can do to start to level the playing field with regards to not only our second class citizenship here in the United States, but you know, our position in the world as you know, folks that uh, suffer from the effects of uh, white supremacy. Okay, I love it. That's good. I got a goosebump. The, only because we have been going along for so long until the pain and suffering becomes um, uh, ordinary is not a is not is not the proper word. But I tell people in my in my comings and going is that we become comfortable in our discomfort. Um, and the question then, Daryl, is ownership being important, being essential. Um, from your experiences, what have you seen to be some of the greater, the greatest hurdles, other than the systemic racism and, and bias or bigotry that uh, that is sort of the, you know, the, the the cornerstone, so to speak, of the downfall. Mm -hmm. Outside of, of that, of those things, outside of systemic and institutional racism and, and, and those barriers that have been set up, mm -hmm. we have to free our minds and support each other, work together, understand our relationship to the world and what that means on every level, whether it's social, physical, economic, spiritual, even. Uh, many of uh, us, you know, are spiritually bankrupt. Um, you know, the If you look in New Jersey, the average black household is economically bankrupt, you know, making 5,000 being worth about $5,000. Uh, 
whereas you know the average you know white family is worth about 170,000 in New Jersey um, and the numbers might be a little off but it's something like that yeah i think so that's right mm -hmm. yeah I, I i saw something where where it said that the average um the average african american and black family what um has nothing more than maybe $3,000 something crazy like that and that mm -hmm. and net worth yeah which mm -hmm. is crazy and then even with the 170, 180 of net worth for the counterparts, um, majority of that comes from home ownership, right? And then the ability to take something like home ownership and being able to use it as a catapult, putting it into other things, whether it is someone buying a business, could be someone maybe making other investments, maybe it mm -hmm. is investment real estate, um, maybe it is sending their child to college those things um I, don't know, I feel like it's a, it's an essential building building block to uh to wealth i agree 100 percent. it's completely essential and it, it's it's a cornerstone to, to wealth building if you look at the millionaires and billionaires in this country and look at how they made their money a majority of them have done it through real estate uh, real estate ownership, real estate investment, um, and you know, coupled with business ownership and and stock ownership and stock investing, you know, then you know, if we can start to adopt some of those strategies, then I think that we can change our our situation. Many people want us to get reparations. And I'm all for reparations, but I think that we have to start taking action to get our own reparations through the market, through investing, through the stock market, uh, through land ownership, through real estate investing. And if more of us start to do that and do it collectively, then we, that conversation about, you know, the government giving us something is a conversation that you're going to ha have much less because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they'll never give us, you know, what we're owed, what we're worth. Um, but we can, we can take that and more through investment and ownership. Mm -hmm. I was, I was just thinking, and I don't know what the cliches are uh, in and around Newark or other areas that you operate. But here in Indianapolis, yesteryear, it was redlining, um, which becomes one of the institutional biases um, for, for the underserved and uh, the low income, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So now it's, it's, now it's zip codes, and there are all a, a lot of other ways of for for big business or banks or lending institutions to say yes but no mm -hmm. you know yeah. um so the question in my mind daryl is you know with with what i see you're doing how have you been able to educate people to get them proactive rather than reactive to what it is that you're trying to get accomplished yeah I think that the education has happened organically because it's not been something that I set out to do at this stage. Mm -hmm. At this stage, I'm really just trying to raise capital so that we can build a building. And once we build that building, we're gonna put tenants in there and those mm -hmm. tenants will be able to start to save for home ownership because we're going to take 10% of that tenant's rent and put it in an account for them and invest it conservatively for them. So after some period between three and five years, they'll have enough money for a down payment and closing costs on a new home of their own somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But the other side of that program is, is an educational program where we're going to provide credit repair services and education, mm -hmm. first time home buyer education and financial literacy education 
on investing and ownership and budgeting and saving and money management um, to you know, help equip the tenants in the building with ways to, to save their money, to keep their money and to grow their money. So, you know, we would encourage folks to, to, to purchase a two family home or a three family home when they leave uh, Savers Village, which is what we're calling the apartment so that their tenants can pay their mortgage and they can save that money for other investments or to purchase another building. We, so just wanna say this real quick, real quick Hank. Earlier today, Hank and I met with, a, with another gentleman and- um, Oh boy. And he's, he's currently purchasing build, uh, businesses, excuse me, businesses. Mm -hmm. But the way that he first got started was that he out of college purchased a duplex and that duplex allowed him to further, you know, gain appreciation, gain cash flow, et cetera, et cetera, to where now he was able to utilize that into other aspects. And now he's buying, he's, he's on his fifth business that he's purchasing, right? Mm -hmm. so, and what I love what you're, what you're saying, Daryl, is that this gives them a launch pad so that they can go ahead and do that. <laughs> The question that I was going to ask, uh, Daryl, because um, some years ago I was the executive director of, a, director of a community development corporation here in Indianapolis, um, and the and the focus was to help to provide repair and and um, um, home assistance and um, and home ownership and all that other stuff to to the uh, community. But the thing that I ran into was that this, there was a terminology that was floated about that was called um, capacity. So I guess my question is that, is the, is the city of Newark or are there some federal programs that you're able to tap into that would come alongside this amazing initiative that you've launched to help to not create just, I think it, what is it, 39? Yeah. Uh, whatever the number is in, in, in your facility, but that they can see the value and the worth and they would come alongside and do some either matching or, or guarantees or something. Um, has that been? Has that been broached in any fashion? Absolutely. The city of Newark has been an integral partner in this initiative. Fantastic. We are, uh, they're selling the land to us at, um, at a, a number that's far less than retail. Okay. It's city owned land that we're, that we're gonna put the building on and we have to buy it. Mm -hmm. but we're buying it for about a third of retail. Okay. Okay. So, um, will there be something like uh, tax credits or what have you because you're doing revitalization, uh, what have you in the in the whatever the the locale is in, there in Newark? Um, well, I mean, you know, there's there's tax credit programs. Um, the two main ones are, are you know new markets tax credits. Mm -hmm. and, and low income tax credits. Okay. And, mo and I think, you know, both of those programs are mostly available to developments that are 50 units and up. Right, and highly competitive. Very much so. Okay. You know, it's very rare that a, that a new first time developer gets that money. Capacity, they call it, track record, yep. Right, track record. That being said, there are some some other programs uh, under HUD. Okay. Uh, you know, there's home funds that Newark right. uh, that Newark receives that you know we'll be looking to, to to benefit from, and there's local pilot programs. Pilot meaning payment in lieu of taxes mm -hmm. that uh, that we can apply for, and you know, and then also we can apply for tax abatements. Newark does allow for 30-year tax abatements for for development. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah. It's a well, bond, basically. In, in, in hearing all of that, because I remember the struggles that, you know, had here in Indianapolis, you know, they were looking at 10-year abatements. But the, but the, the point I want to make is, I would imagine that you've got a waiting list for people who want to participate in your program, such that you already laying the foundation for, for iteration two or iteration three or iteration four, or am I being naive? No, you're not. There's, uh, there's been a lot of interest because there has been some press around the, the initiative. So okay. we are fielding calls from folks that, that want to, to move in, you know, and we're, you know, we won't be ready to take tenants, uh, you know, probably until first quarter, you know, 2023. So, but the interest is there. I mean, we can, we can fill that building up right today. Right. And, and uh, so, that, you know, that being said, we do um, are starting also to field calls from other cities and other parts of Newark and I would imagine. other states. Yeah that are very interested in the program and would love to see something like this in, in their localities as well. So That's it's awesome. something that we'd love to do in every city. That's awesome. I, it, I mean, it sounds like a positive we work. I'm, 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 I get goosebumps just, just thinking about the, again, the possibility. And I'm just hoping that there aren't some naysayers or some people that, that sees progress, people that see progress that's happening like, like this initiative and rather than providing support, they provide roadblocks and and you know potholes and stuff. Well, you know, this is it's uh it's not it's not gonna be easy. And you know, there's 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 some people that that have a problem for every solution. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> we're going to try to avoid, uh, you know, falling into those traps um, when we see them arising. And, uh, so, 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 Daryl, so, you know, experience has taught me that sometimes people who come as collaborators, supporters of your initiative come to steal the idea and then sabotage you from the inside without you not you knowing that. So I'm yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm I would imagine that uh the <laughs> the due diligence for those who who come bearing gifts. <laughs> I'll leave it at yeah. You know what I'm saying. Hank, Hank is okay. Hank is doing all this because he he's been in a, in a similar situation. That's what that's what's going on here. So, well, yeah, you know, be, believing people and then those individuals will make certain that your castle never gets built, mm -hmm. and and you don't even realize that it happened. You know, but but again, let's let's not talk about what. What happened to me, Daryl? I apologize, sir. This is this is right. this is your show. I'm just I'm giddy about what when I when I went on your website and I saw all the stuff that you're doing to to help to help Newark. And and the crazy thing about it is, based on your credentials, you could do anything. And you have and you're choosing to do this. I hope people realize what a blessing it is to them. And it's probably a blessing to you, but it's also a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. They may not realize that. And, 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 and what I wanted to know, well, what I want the listeners to, to understand, you mentioned something such as down payment. And mm -hmm. someone may, may think, oh, that's, that's small. Why would they need to have so much time and investment into a down payment? But depending on where someone is within the United States, down payments are bigger than the normal, right? Like in, in Indianapolis, a person's like, oh, it's an $80,000 home. It's a down payment. No big deal. But on the East Coast, houses can be pretty expensive. Oh, yeah. You know, um, you're looking at average houses of four, you know, cost of 400000 500000 in in North Jersey. Uh, 
and you know that's half of what you'll pay for a house in New York. Wow. Uh, and this is, you know, a pretty average house, 1,500 square feet, three bedroom, two bath, you know, on a 2,500 square foot lot. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not uh, a mansion. <laughs> and that down payment could be significant. Mm -hmm. that, that down payment could be $10,000. And so people often, they start to save, you know, you'll have 3,000 and then you got to get braces for the kid. You know, they'll have they'll have two thousand, they'll have saved up and they, they'll owe some money to the IRS. Or, you know, they'll have four thousand saved up, then you know, they have to replace the tires on the car. So mm -hmm. always you know, living. That's before awesome. you know it, a decade has gone by, mm -hmm. you know, and you haven't been able to save up. And uh, you know, it's it becomes something where people need assistance. Newark is a place where 75% of the residents are renters and only 25% of the residents own their homes. So the, there's, a, you know, there's an effort to switch those, you know, to flip those numbers where you'll, you have 75% homeowners and 25% renters. Um, and so we have a long way to go. And this is just, you know, my little way to help. It's not little. <laughs> are traditional banks willing to come to the table or you have to just use some creative financing for, for people who, upon the day they move in, they've got the down payment to start to buy their unit? So the way that this is going to work is that the units will always stay rentals. Ah, oh, OK. All right, I see it now, OK. It's so the pipeline, you know, I get it. Right. So once they're ready to, to buy a home, they'll take that money, they'll buy somewhere else. And then a new tenant will move in and start the savings program, start the education program. Will your organization play a role in the transition to sort of help them to to go from your from your place to their place? Absolutely. You know, most likely it will be more of a consulting where we'll direct them to, to programs that are helpful. Um, you know, I, uh, I actually like, you know, programs like NACA, um, Neighborhood Assistance Corporation of America that help uh, people purchase homes uh -huh. um, and your credit score doesn't matter. You know, um, and you know, I think that it's it's a really good program, and you know, it, it helps you know folks that really need the the extra the extra help. It takes a little longer mm -hmm. um, to qualify, but it's completely worth it. NACA pays your uh, your closing costs for you uh, if you go through the program. Wow! And yeah, it's. Uh, wow. Yeah, I would check it out. Because and, a lot of people um, don't realize and, that they, get, they think about the down payment, mm -hmm. but then they don't consider the closing costs. Right. In Newark, in, in Newark specifically, the, the mayor work, has worked something out with the federal government where people that have Section 8 vouchers mm -hmm. can take those vouchers. Mm -hmm. And instead of giving them to a landlord, they can take those and use them um, as as down payments on on new homes to become homeowners. You're right because some years ago they there was a program where section you could buy a, a house through the Section Eight program. And I don't you know I didn't I never we I never had anybody that quote qualified and went through that process. But to me that's a no I mean that's a no brainer if you can use those same dollars and put somebody in something that's that's theirs. Because eventually, oh, you know, they're going to have to stand up on their own. But the point is, it's their house. It's theirs. Ownership. You know, That's good. Own, ownership. That's all we're trying to do. Ownership. Right. That's good. Whew, man, this is this is deep. Daryl, and um, can you tell us what what goes through your mind when you think of the game of chess? 
Uh, chess, you know, is um, chess is fun, and chess chess is life. Chess really helps you to think ahead. It helps you to understand the consequences of your actions in real time. It helps you to be a better planner. It helps with patience. It helps with trusting your instincts. Mm, mm, mm. Um, you know, chess is it's a it's a great way to sort of you know, practice the skills, the life skills you know, that will help you to be a successful person. And you know, you can't cheat at chess. You know, so it. it it's all right there, you know, uh, right in front of you and you and your opponent and whoever's looking at the, the board, they can see every move that's being made, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really, really like chess. Um, and I, you know, I figure you asked that because of uh, the program that I'm a part of called the Newark Chess Club. Mm -hmm. And we use it, we use chess to teach life skills to young people. And we're in about 40 schools in Newark now and uh, provide the, the children with mentors. And we've given you know, about $50,000 worth of scholarships to children over the years that have won our tournaments and that have participated in our programs. So I'm not uh, a grandmaster, but you, know, you wouldn't want to play me <laughs> you you bad. I, <laughs> you know. He said, "I don't have to ball up my fist to whip you." <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's a lot. Of, you know, here, you know, it gives me a chance to talk smack. So I, pack I a lunch, it. huh? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah. What uh, what what drove you to? Uh, to, to pursue getting your JD? Uh, I wanted to, um, to sort of help, uh, to help our people, you know? Um, and I, it was just another tool in the tool belt to be able to do that. I needed to be able to understand the laws and I needed to, if I needed to put myself in a position to help you know, as a, as a social engineer, you know, um, which is what- could have changed, huh? That's right, yeah. You Be know, it's, because of your insight, do you, are, are people threatened by, by you? I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, I really don't think so, you know, no, no. I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> At least you hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes I hope that they are, you know, um, depending on who the people are. Right. Okay. Okay. You know, um, that's, fair. that's fair. You know, I'm in a, I'm in an adversarial field. That's my point. Less than, less than 5% of all lawyers are black lawyers yeah. you know, in America. Black? Yeah. Yeah, you yeah you have you know just under five percent of all lawyers in America are black. So it's uh, I deal you know I deal with being you know with being questioned constantly. You know my intelligence is always questioned. Okay. Uh, yeah, you because... you, you, you you they find you threatening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so yeah, I'm laughing not because it's funny. I'm just laughing because it's so real. So, so real. You're trying to get stuff done and they worried about what you're doing. <sighs> Thank you so much for sharing, Willie. Leela, now you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I know. <laughs> 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 That's an inside joke, Daryl. It's oh man, people feel no, insecure for no reason other than they're insecure. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, 
so so with you so with you helping other people um why was it important for you to take on this initiative instead of waiting for maybe uh the city or the state to to finally say oh, what are we doing let's step in um you know knowing how local government works and knowing how state government works they're looking for people to take initiative you know, they're um you know i don't think that they're necessarily looking to um do everything on the on their own mm -hmm. there has to be in order for local elected officials that look like us to be successful there has to be public private partnership because they don't have the resources to to serve their to serve our communities you know, if you look around the country you know wherever there's a martin luther king jr boulevard that's probably the most depressed place in that state and they they probably have black, black representation on the local level and the state level and you know and in congress Mm -hmm. And so you, you say, why we have these black elected officials, you know, why is there still so much poverty? You know, even Donald Trump would, would you know, you know, rest in peace to, to, uh, to John Lewis, but Donald Trump would always say, John Lewis, he has, you know, the worst district, you know, in, in, a, in, in Georgia, like, you know, the, the most poverty. And so why do people keep reelecting him? You know, it's, it's like the worst, it's mm -hmm. the worst, but... Mm -hmm. Donald Trump obviously is an idiot, but, you know, the reason is because, you know, those neighborhoods, you know, have been systematically cut out of resources. And so the places, you know, I'm sure you know this, the places that have a greater population and that are greater economic generators subsidize, you know, like, so places like, you know, Atlanta, New York, California, Florida subsidize places like you know Idaho, Kentucky, you know Montana, and because you know every state gets two senators, yep. regardless of size, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So and so the allocations, you know, are often unequal because of because there's equal amounts of votes in the Senate. You know, so it's you know, you know. There has to be um, help from the private sector for for our most depressed areas, because you know there's not enough congressmen and senators that actually care about the places that have people that look like us mm -hmm. to to really truly make those places better. Uh -huh. It's just you know, and it, it really all just comes not all of it, but most of but, you know, it, it goes back to what we talked about in the beginning, you know, just the people in power, you know, really trying to keep it for themselves and not sharing it, you know, with the folks that have built this country. So we have to do our own things. Uh -huh. um, with all that you have going on, and there's no doubt that you're able to, to manage it all, what is your five, um, five year, 10 year plan? As you as you as you peruse the landscape today, yeah, that's a great question. And I, I really have three initiatives. I have my law practice. Um, I have this uh, real estate development, and I have the chess program. And you know, in five years, I'd love for each of them to grow. Tremendously, you know, and my goal is to is to triple each each one in size within the next five years, and then in the next ten years to triple it again. And that's uh, it's doable, but you know, it's it's a it's a big challenge. Um, and I know that it's possible with the right systems in place and the right teams in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. That is is where you know my focus is developing people around me uh, that that you know buy into into my crazy ideas and you know grooming them uh, and supporting them to help you know to to help their dreams come true uh, and um, you know just kind of help people understand that we can all win you know. 
there's that that saying, if you want to go fast, go by yourself. But you know, if you want to go far, go with other people. Right? Yes. Um, and you know, our community, you know, we we do have issues with working collectively you know, because of a lack of trust that we that we have amongst these, ourselves. So we have to, you know, figure out ways to overcome that, and, um, and and start to, you know, build that trust. And you know, it really kind of stems from, you know, the self hate that that's been ingrained in us, and you know, that's on purpose mm -hmm. through the media, through religion, through policy. You know, um, you mentioned redlining. You know, um, and you know, it's not a coincidence where we are as a P and it's not because we're lazy or, it's, you know, it's, um, it's a program. 400 know. years of indoctrination. Absolutely. You know, Carter G. Woodson, thought, you know, says that, you know, once you control a man's mind, he's not, he's going to automatically go to the back door. He's not going to try to go through the front door. He's going to go to the back door. And if there's no back door, He's going to cut one out of the wall and build a back door so that he can walk through it. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it's a daily struggle, you know, because it's still happening 24 7. It's happening now on steroids. Right. right. You know? Maybe not on steroids, just at an at a, at a area that we can see it, right? Because may, maybe it's been, a, maybe it's been consistent, but now, there is more, uh, more being reported on it. Well, I, I, in Leland, I say steroids also in the sense that you, you think about all of the, you know, it's, just, it, it's bigger than voting rights, but vote, voting rights is it's what getting people attention now, but it's happening in municipalities. I mean, like on master blast, you know? Mm -hmm. And you know, and again, you you know you know I grew up in the segregated South, and you know I could tell you some of the stories of stuff that happened there, and and um, and I think it was during Reconstruction there were more black people in Congress and had power during Reconstruction than than today, and you know, and it and you have to sit back and ask yourself why. And again, it goes back to that 400 years of, of, of indoctrination. I remember listening to a person one day and, and she had letting us know that your environment changes your physiology. Mm -hmm. You know, and I thought about that for a while and I say, you know, that that's really that's really deep. You know, in how we think, how we think, um, we pass that down to how our children think. Yeah. You know? Consciously or unconsciously. <sighs> What's it called? Unconscious bias? Mm hmm You know? So getting 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 back to you, Mr. Darrell. We didn't we didn't want to, you know, take you. I, it's it's just curious as to how how you'll be able to, to move forward. And you've already talked about how you are um, mentoring other people to be willing to step up. Um, and I think that's, that's commendable because there, there's a mindset that if, if I started it, it's mine and don't want anybody else to, to be involved with it. So what I uh, upon my de demise or when I step aside, it, it, it dies a natural death. So the point is that I'm happy that I think I heard you say that you'll be trying to promulgate whatever uh, in, uh, uh, if, 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 if not indefinitely, but for a long time. Well, yeah, I mean, you have to have, you know, goals that you may not be able to see it till the end, you know. The goal, the goal has to be to create things that are going to outlive you. Right. Um, that has that has to be the goal. And many of us, <coughs> you know, excuse me, are still are still working. You know, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around having goals like that. Um, or people are just afraid and don't realize what it is that they're afraid of. Right. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people afraid, say, afraid oh. of the dark. Why are you afraid? There's nobody around. There's, 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 there's nothing. You know, yeah. I could understand if you're going up in a plane, going to jump out of a parachute, that'll kill you. But the dark won't kill you. Yeah. The fear is not real, but it's it's powerful. Oh, whew. it's, it's very powerful. It's par it's paralyzing, like you said. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, conversations like this hopefully will help help people to start thinking differently um, about what's and possible. You know, it's, it's really about Dillon, what's possible. Maybe, yep. maybe we can bring Mr. Darrell back on in about six months or a year down the road. Agreed. To, to sort of like, okay, because by then, Darrell, we would have we would have had more traction in what it is that we're doing. And um, because you were talking about having a credit repair program, and I don't know how it works in your neighborhood, but um, but um, we are creating partnerships or collaboration with individuals that uh, we use to help get people repaired, not necessarily keep them repaired, but just just get them repaired because they don't think that they can. Because every time they turn around, as you say, there are tires for the car or the kid needs braces or what have you. Um, so. Um, and and um, so you're right, Hank. So we should do that. Does it sound, does that sound proper for you, Daryl? I don't want to I don't want to have you to commit to something that uh, that may not be meaningful. Oh, yeah, this that would be great. Uh, I would really, really enjoy that very much. Oh, okay, sir. Well. So, Daryl, if someone, so for someone who's listening and they're, they're thinking, thinking to, to, to themselves, if I live in Orlando, Florida, why should I um, look at this initiative as something that I should invest or vote with with my dollar? That's a great question. You know, uh, like like any investment, the goal is to give them back a return on their money. So uh, if they invest $5,000 with us, uh, we're going to triple that to 15000 in about 10 years or so. And uh, if they put that same 5000 in the bank in 10 years, they're going to get $5,001. And one dollar. They'll, they'll, get, they'll have 5001 <laughs> And we'll give them fifteen thousand. We'll your banker here sometime soon. That's a question I'm going to ask them. Why should I leave my money in your bank and and let you use it and I don't have it? I, and, and you give me a penny. Right. That's a great question. Um, so I I would say that you know it's a it's a great way to invest your money. You're, you're doing good um, by supporting an initiative that's going to turn renters into homeowners, and you're doing well by turning your 5,000 into 15,000. So, you know, it's, it's a win-win for you as the investor. And, and then we'll have them to circle back to us and we can show them how they can invest that 15,000 in a program that we're That's working right. on that will provide long-term ongoing income. That's good. What is, um... What do you think will be the biggest hurdle for um, for anyone that doesn't believe that the things we're talking about uh, is true, right? So you know you're you're saying, hey, here's here's what this community needs, but then of course there's always some people that, that think to themselves, you know, that's not true, or there's no way that that community community needs that, or why why does this company or, or this family need need to save a down payment, right? How can we help them to actually realize that no, not these these things are true, and these are families that actually need uh, need help and assistance, and it also benefits the community. It benefits everyone when this happens. Everybody. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a great question because you will have a lot of folks, but I think just through you know conversation, talking to them, showing them the facts, and presenting the facts to them, okay, uh, is really the best way to do that. Um, and through dialogue, through understanding their perspective and understanding why they feel that way, you know, are they dealing with, are we, are we working with the same set of facts? Mm -hmm. 
Mm, you know, mm, once uh, mm. once we're working with the same set of facts, then that's going to be a quick conversation. You know, the, it won't take long to 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 get them to to see things from from how I see them. And then after that, you know, I can't really spend time convincing. I have to spend time moving with the folks that want to move with me. So, and they have to come with a can-do attitude rather than. Well, you sure this is going to do such and such and such and such? Why are you right. going to work, Daryl? Mm -hmm. You right. know, yeah. Right. You know. Your question is how we're going to do that. Just keep that question to yourself. That's good. Um, we've been. I've been blessed today. I, I feel. I feel a certain kinship, Mister Daryl. I don't. I don't. I don't say that lightly to a lot of people that I meet, but I don't know. It's just. I don't know, my friend. I just, I sort of feel I met a soul brother today. So I just appreciate you. I just, <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That's, you know, that's really um, a, uh, I guess, a culmination of, you know, the values that I learned from my parents and the people that have been in my life that have guided me and directed me um, to this to this point today. So I can't I can't take any of that credit. You know, I have to give that credit to the people that God has placed in my life, um, and you know, the people that I've uh, been blessed enough to be around, um, and the people you know that that I listen to. Uh, so I, I give all the all the credit to them. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. See again, that's part of the humility that I saw earlier on. You know, quietly, you know, just just competent, confident, but uh, with a certain quietness about you. But like you said, wouldn't want to take you on. <laughs> in chess, that's right. Two qu two oh, no. questions. Oh, no. no, in general, in general, no, I got don't, you. Don't limit it to chess now. I got you. <laughs> two, two questions be before we conclude. Okay, um, can you tell us what impact? reverse mortgages have on on wealth and in generational wealth and then the second question is if there's anything that you want to leave with the audience today what would it be uh so reverse mortgages you know as you know it's uh it's when an investor or a speculator you know comes to you after you've owned your home they'll say you know you can use some cash your house is worth three hundred thousand. I'm going to give you three hundred thousand dollars right now, but when you pass away, I'm going to take your house. I own your home, and you know you've, you know you're in your your twilight years. You could use some cash. You want to travel. You want to do some things. You're not. You don't make enough money from uh, retirement, or you know you haven't invested, and you have. You know you might have things you want to do around the house. You might want to repair the roof. You want you might you might want to drive that car that you you know, the, uh, the 1960 Thunderbird that you grew up loving, you know, you might want to get a, get that. So you say, all right, I'm going to take the deal. And, you know, you don't read the fine print. You don't have a lawyer look over the contract. You don't realize that you still have to pay your taxes and insurance or, or, you know, there's stipulations in these, in these contracts that you didn't read that, you know, uh, accelerate the terms of this reverse mortgage. The next thing you know, you're being foreclosed on and you, you're nowhere near dead, you know? Um, and so you're being kicked out of your home uh, and your home is being taken from you by this reverse mortgage company. So this, these mortgages have, you know, they've been around for maybe a decade or so heavily targeting uh, the black community. You know, those, those red line, those communities that, that were formerly red line you know, mm -hmm. where people eventually, you know, did start to own those homes years and years later, you know, not everybody, of course, but, uh, you know, and so, um, you know, we have to do, we have to do a lot of education around uh, this issue uh, because I see it in this, in this area. And, um, you know, folks come to me saying, uh, you know, my mom, um, you know, just uh, 
passed away and you know she tried you know she um you know we want the house you know but she signed this she did this reverse mortgage thing you know um and so now that house is not passed down to the next generation and that wealth that 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 you know that that foundation that platform that that the daughters and the granddaughters and the great granddaughters would have had in other communities to start to stabilize their lives is not there. And they're starting from scratch after every generation. It gets, it gets harder and harder. Right, because things get more and more expensive as time goes on. And the value of money, you know, is starting is is you know decreasing as time goes on. You know? So wages have been stagnant for the last 25 years. And what, you know, inflation has gone up. So how does that work? You know, when when things are more expensive but wages haven't gone up, you know. That's so okay. that's why we have the middle class being squeezed. Um, so you have, you know, the very poor and there's services for the poor, you know, there should be more. And there's certain, and, and you know, the, the super wealthy, you know, have made more during the pandemic they made you know that was a, they made more money than they ever made in that short amount of time mm -hmm. you know when, you know if you understand what, that you know that the pandemic was a was a there was a catalyst right there was a there was a wealth transfer you know um to the one percent uh where you, you you saw that the the richest of the rich you know triple their their wealth during the pandemic like how does that happen? So, um, so you know, the working class, the working, the middle class, is decreasing and being squeezed out, and um, you know, there's uh, there has to be uh, you know something uh, you know for us. So um, you know, that's um, that's that's what we're dealing with. It's uh, we're seeing it um, on a macro level. And we see, and I see it on a micro level. Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, your second question was, um, what do I want people to know? Um, you know, I'd love for people to invest in Savers Village at smallchange.co. And you know, if you are, um, you know, someone that wants to do good and do well at the same time. And you have a minimum of one thousand dollars, and would like to invest. It's a great opportunity to do that. And then, uh, you know, I'd love for people to, you know, join a local organization in your town, and start to get involved civically. And you know, also, you know, go to go down to the Y, and you know, mentor a kid. You know, pick a kid and mentor that kid for a year. You know, it doesn't have to be. It's it can be an hour a week. Um, and if you, you know, I, I know something that works, you know, you could play a game of chess with that kid once a week and just talk about life, you know, for that hour. And, you know, the benefit of that will be tremendous. So um, that's all I got. Thank you guys. This one quick question fun. that I'm going to go with. This is, this is an easy one. What kind of law do you practice? I practice mostly real estate and business. Okay, I do a lot of do a lot of contract work, a lot of real estate. Um, I do some wills for folks, which is another thing that you know our folks don't have wills. So, but when when we die, whatever assets we have have to be probated by the state, and it's just a long process. And a lot of times, you know, uh, that their assets don't get passed down. But um, mostly business and, and real estate. Uh, I don't really focus on. Uh, criminal or family or anything like that. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I stay on transactional work. Well, you, you mentioned wills uh, for people's estates. Do you find that a lot of small businesses, even in Newark, have not uh, incorporated? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I do. I do find that. And uh, I, I would have to say, you know, please incorporate your business because there's lots of benefits. You can get business credit that folks don't know about. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, credit that's not in your name, that's in the name of your business. The business is open for two years and you're able to, you know, pay, pay off your debts, you know, for six months, you know, and that could be a, a, a gas card, a Staples card, you know, um, you know, a Home Depot card, mm-hmm. get these, get these cards, get $500 each, pay that off for, 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 for six months, you know, not even, you know, then you can walk into a bank and apply for a hundred thousand dollars in business credit and be approved, you know, um, so, you know, credit is important. Um, setting up your businesses, owning businesses, you know, mm-hmm. I think for us is crucial. You know, we, we need to own our, our businesses. We need to be able to leave things to our, to our heirs uh, when we pass. You know, okay. um, I think my, my parents' generation, they did their job. They got, yeah. they got great jobs. They got pensions. They, uh, they, they made sure that, that all of us got our college educations. You know, but now I think for us, you know, we have to make sure that our children learn a different way, you know, to invest, to own businesses, you know, to put your money to work for you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that, I think that that's the, you know, the zeitgeist that, that we have to share with, with, with our with our, our the next generations. Hey, Daryl, real quick. Uh, do you guys utilize trust? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. You know, trust is a great way to avoid probate um, and to protect your assets against against any creditors. You know, know, just in case something something happens, you know, um, yeah, I recommend that folks uh, that own and that own things, you know, put their assets into trust to keep them safe and protected so that their their kids and grandkids can uh, can own them without any issues. I love it. That's that's a great way to keep generational wealth. Seriously, it's yeah, it's crucial. It's crucial. Um, did you hear about the tax, the potential tax that the uh, the government may have on estates going forward, taxing them about forty five percent? Oh, no, nah, yeah. I haven't heard about that. Yeah. That's great. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm sure once we read the law, that we'll see that there's a little loophole for the super for the ultra wealthy. You know, so then, right? They put it right in the law. Yeah. You know, I run a I run a five hundred one c three nonprofit, and that's the whole purpose of it is a way for the the wealthy to keep their their dollars from going to the U.S. government, and mm-hmm. it's the law. You know, the law. Mm-hmm. It's legal. Yeah. yeah that's it. So awesome. Okay. Well, I hope you guys were listening though, because. Daryl just gave you guys some amazing tips when it comes to investing and for tax strategy. I hope you guys are listening to that. I I hope and generational wealth. I hope you guys are listening to that. If you did not catch those tips, rewind it about five minutes. He literally gave you guys a roadmap. So please, please, please utilize that. And then also reach out to Daryl too. Please reach out to Daryl. Yeah. um... You could reach out to me. I'm on, I'm on all the social media. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, just under my name, Daryl Scipio. Uh, um, LinkedIn. I'm I'm on I'm on all the, all of them. So you know, please uh, please reach out to me if you uh, you know Daryl Scipio at Gmail. That's my email address. You know, just my my full name at gmail.com. Um, so I would be happy to hear from anyone uh, that's. Uh, that, that can hear my voice today. Awesome. And Scipio is spelled S-C-I-P-I-O. Yep. All right. That's it, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much, sir. God bless. When I come to Newark, 